This is Mark Tobias at the USA Cybercrime Conference near Washington, and I'm speaking with Phil Zimmerman. Uh, Phil is the father of PGP, and famous as really he began the encryption revolution, I would say. You think that's a fair characterization? Well, I don't want to take credit for uh, such a sweeping uh, uh, <laughs> accusation. Well, but <laughs> no, what, what I what I mean is, uh, you know, there's a whole crypto industry now. But yeah. but but in 1991, when PGP came out, um, there wasn't much of a crypto industry, and, no. and there wasn't it wasn't possible for an ordinary person to communicate securely over great distances without the risk of interception. No, you figured out really how to commercialize it, or the beginning of commercialization, which is what I meant to say. So you began this way before you introduced PGP as a software engineer, is that correct? Well, yeah, I was interested in crypto um, for much of my career. Um, and and I, I started working on it in earnest in the 1980s. And so when you introduced or released PGP 1.0, which for the, my readers that don't know what PGP is, is pretty good privacy, which was the name you chose. Um, it created a frenzy, would that be fair to say? Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, underestimated how popular it would, it would be. And then what happened? Well, the government, um, <clears throat> the government took interest in it. Um, there was also, <coughs> pardon me. There was also a company that had a, that had a patent on the RSA algorithm, and uh, that, that's a public key algorithm that I used in the early versions of PGP. And they uh, they viewed this as a competitive threat, and so they uh, they asked the government to uh, come after me and put me in prison, and so. Uh, the criminal investigation that went on for three years was instigated by uh, by RSA, and uh, uh, it was an investigation about export controls, about how PGP spread around the world, um, and, and uh, at that time it was illegal to export strong encryption. That's not true today, but it was true in the 1990s. And the reason for that would probably be pretty obvious, is that our government would not be able to intercept communications, foreign communications, if PGP went worldwide and became used by everybody. Would that be yeah. fair? At that time, uh, the NSA uh, benefited from a lack of crypto expertise around the world. And so they didn't want uh, the rest of the world to uh, become more sophisticated in cryptography. And then we had, as I recall, uh, the Clipper chip program. Yeah, the Clipper chip was uh, an attempt by the FBI to oppose domestic controls on encryption. Not export controls, that right. was something the NSA was interested in. But um, the, the Clipper chip was a, a, a chip that the FBI wanted to manufacture and, and put into everyone's phone and it would encrypt your phone calls and every chip ha would have a, a, a key that was unique for that chip and the FBI would keep a copy of that key for wiretap purposes mm -hmm. in a vast government database. And was this, did this begin, I don't remember, during the analog phone days or was this when TDMA and CDMA were introduced? Well, it was, uh, I mean the phone the phone network at that time was mostly analog, mm -hmm. but um, people were starting to think about digital telephony and the opportunities to encrypt phone calls that would come from digital telephony. And AT&T uh, came out with a product that encrypted uh, a phone call. It was called the AT&T 3600. It, it, it used DES encryption. Uh, right. DES was right. the federal data encry encryption standard which had a 56-bit key, which was not a very strong key. But it was enough to alarm uh, uh, the, the FBI and the NSA. And so um, the NSA went and bought all the uh, copies of the AT&T 3600 and uh, 
the FBI proposed the Clipper chip, which would have this thing called key escrow, where they would keep a copy of the key. And, and they asked AT&T to uh, have another go at it, make the AT&T 3600 not use the DES, but use a, a, a Clipper chip. Instead. Their own system, yeah. yeah. And that didn't work too well. They, they underestimated the, uh, the public uh, backlash against uh, a chip that was designed for surveillance. And so did Congress kill the program, or they just backed off? I th well, I, they backed off. I mean, it, the Clipper chip was never going to go anywhere. There was no market response. That mm -hmm. Nobody would ever buy a product with a Clipper chip in it. So initially, nobody, there wasn't much encryption on the networks. And it wasn't mandated. And when we were sitting on a panel this morning, I was thinking, you know, look what's changed. Now, yeah. if you don't encrypt data, you're in trouble. That's right. Well, yeah, in the 90s, <clears throat> if you use strong encryption, you had to explain yourself. Yes. Why you would you be, hide? Yeah, why would you be doing that? Yeah. But now, um, you know, the export controls were lifted in, in, the, in 2000. Uh, the domestic controls never took hold. Uh, the FBI, you know, was severely beaten on the clipper chip. And uh, the legislative environment today is, is uh, uh, opposite. Totally, 180 now, degrees out of now phase. Now you're obligated yeah. to use strong crypto. And Phil, when you say strong encryption in the 90s, does that mean 56-bit, 128-bit, 256-bit? What did that mean then? Uh, well, strong encryption would be like 128-bit uh, keys. Uh, there was a, uh, a federal data encryption standard at that time um, whose key size was 56 bits. but it was possible to construct a machine that could exhaust that key space in a reasonably short period of time. So today, where's the consumer at with regard to encryption of their telephone calls? You've developed a black phone. Well, today, uh, the whole telephone industry is, um, is moving more, it has already moved toward VoIP, voice over IP. Right. And, um, and really the manifest destiny of all of telephony is uh, voice over inter internet protocol. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you look at um, the whole of the VoIP industry, most uh, VoIP calls are not encrypted at all. There's no encryption being used. Um, but then if you look at um, the small minority that is encrypted, most of that is encrypted with a, a, a protocol uh, that involves sending the keys to uh, the server, the SIP server. Uh, SIP is, is the, the part of the protocol that sets up the call, right. you know, not the part that keeps it going after it's set up. And um, that's a wiretap friendly protocol. It's called SDES. It means um, SDP session encryption. Uh, SDP, what is it called? Uh, I, I forgot what the acronym right. means. But session description protocol or something like right. that. And it's where you have your device send a session key to the server and, and you do it through uh, an SSL tunnel. And now the server has the session key and it sends it to the other person through another SSL tunnel. Now both people can use that session key to encrypt their voice. But the server has a copy of the key, which means it can wiretap you. So that's how things stand. Uh, largely in, in the VoIP world. But I have a protocol called ZRTP that I've been working on for the past decade. And um, it's, uh, it, it, in, it negotiates the cryptographic keys between the two parties without sharing that key with the server. So it's end to end. Yeah. Nearly all phone calls today are, in, are, are sent over uh, internet protocol. It's maybe at the back end. Right. Um, so do I need to worry about the ease of intercepting telephone calls when I make a VoIP call? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, uh, all phone calls, including VoIP calls, um, you, you, you have to worry about interception. In fact, especially VoIP calls. And, and what about my mobile calls? Same thing. So GSM... The Whenever two you're talking on a phone... Unless it's using a very well-designed crypto protocol, you have to assume that it's subject to interception. 
So, uh, reality, uh, I, uh, so I have two carriers, one that's a GSM-based carrier, one that's a CDMA-based carrier. Am I more secure on my cell phone than I am on my landline using VoIP, or is it all the same? All of it is, is, uh, can be easily intercepted. So, in your world, do you think that consumers really need to worry about this? Because most conversations are trivial in nature. Um, we all have something to hide. Um, we all have um, uh, conversations with our doctors, with our accountants, uh, with our lovers, uh, with, with uh, our business colleagues, um, with, uh, you know, if, when you're creating intellectual property, when you're discussing uh, maybe an acquisition of another company. Uh, there's, there, there's countless things that we do in, a, in, a, in our complex society that, uh, that require uh, some protection. I'm a lawyer. We have requirements of confidentiality. Every lawyer does to maintain lawyer-client privilege. You should be using uh, an encryption protocol for your conversations with your clients. On the telephone, yeah, it, because ninety-nine percent of the lawyers are not. Well, uh, you should you should treat it as an obligation. And same thing with the medical community because of HIPAA. That's right. Doctors recognize uh, that they have to encrypt patient records because the law says that they have to. But you, as a lawyer, should recognize it too. Even if the law doesn't require you to encrypt your phone calls. You should recognize it as something that's in the best interest of your clients. That would be a good warning to every lawyer in the country. Yeah. Um, final question. The latest, what I would refer to as SSL debacle, as far as the security breach that has been discovered, and this affects lots of people. How did this happen and is it going to happen I'm assuming again. Well, engineers uh, make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty good that, one. That's a pretty severe mistake. So, do you think we're going to, first of all, has it really had a lot of impact? I mean, have people really been hurt? Well, it's hard, hard to say what yeah. the impact is. Uh, I mean, usually uh, these days, um, the exploits of these kinds of vulnerabilities uh, can be done invisibly and uh, the, the, the people that are doing the exploit quietly take advantage of the information they glean from that. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is also to me the risk of obviously standardization that everybody's got to adopt the same protocols, the same standards, like what could have happened with the Clipper chip, frankly. If there had been a similar bug, then everybody would have had a well, problem. Well, in the case of the Clipper chip, there was a deliberate bug. The Clipper chip's architecture was designed for surveillance. So we're not worried about it not working <laughs> properly. We, we're worried about it working properly. <laughs> so, Phil Zimmerman, what's you, what the takeaway from this for the consumer and readers of Forbes that are business and government? What should they be doing and where is this going? Well, uh, there's a lot of things that we should be doing. Um, we should be, uh, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, I know that's so a much, pretty general so much, question. It is so It is so broad, and how much time do you want to spend? No, 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 but, it's, but the, the real takeaway. Speak, speak for the next hour on what you should be doing. And, right, but is there one or two critical issues that you think people are missing or not paying attention to? Well, for me, uh, for the past decade, I've been uh, interested most of all in uh, secure telephony. And so for that, I have a lot to say about that. If you mm -hmm. want to have secure phone calls, uh, then um, use a protocol that is well designed. Uh, I have one that's well designed. <laughs> and, and I have a company that, uh, you know, makes products and services around that, Silent Circle. If you go to our website, silentcircle.com, you can see what we do. Uh, it, you know, we've all seen a lot about the Snowden revelations. Right. And, um, and, uh, and part of those revelations is that the NSA has talked about 
all the crypto products that they can break into. Conspicuously absent from that list is anything that I ever designed. So um, I feel very good about that. I would also. Phil Zimmerman, thank you very much for uh, speaking with me today. It's my pleasure.